Welcome back, everyone. We're again here broadcasting from my apartment in Queens, New York, and we're continuing our five-day-a-week, Monday through Friday broadcast about this coronavirus, the CCP virus. Today, we're going to be talking about how the Chinese regime destroyed evidence on the virus outbreak. We're going to be going into how it rallied its united front to stockpile medical supplies. And of course, folks, before we get started, if you haven't already, please remember to like and subscribe. Again, we really need your support. Also, if you're on YouTube, click the notification bell. You get alerts when new videos are up. And I don't know if you all noticed, but it's something weird that happened to this channel. Our viewership on YouTube seems to have just dropped by about 50%, I mean, overnight. It seems to have coincided with YouTube banning a lot of other channels, cracking down on some channels. Not clear whether they've done anything to this channel. Maybe it's just happened naturally. But if you like this show, if you like this video, please share it. Please tell others about it. Again, really appreciate your support. So first of all, we're going to be going into this story about how the Chinese regime has been destroying evidence on this virus. So first off, Daily Telegraph Five Eyes report allegedly says China destroyed evidence on how the virus started. And of course, Five Eyes is this intelligence sharing agreement between the United States, Canada, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. And it says a 15-page document from Five Eyes was obtained by the Saturday Telegraph, which apparently is part of the Daily Telegraph, showing a case of negligence against China. This is tied into one of the big investigations being done right now. Did the Chinese regime knowingly cover up information? Did the Chinese regime destroy information? And of course, if the United States and other countries can prove that, very likely things like lawsuits will follow, things like tariffs are going to follow. And the Chinese regime is doing all it can to prevent that from happening. So the article states, quote, China deliberately suppressed or destroyed evidence of the coronavirus outbreak in, in what the report says, quote, an assault on international transparency. It continues that cost tens of thousands of lives. It continues saying it states that to the endangerment of other countries, the Chinese government covered up news of the virus by silencing or disappearing doctors who spoke out, destroying evidence of it in laboratories, and refusing to provide live samples to international scientists who were working on a vaccine. Nothing you all didn't know already, but hey, the government put it in a report, so maybe it's official now. And it continues with something interesting. It says, quote, it can also be revealed the Australian government trained and funded a team of Chinese scientists who belonged to a laboratory which went on to genetically modify deadly coronaviruses that could be transmitted from bats to humans and had no cure. And it is now the subject of a probe into the origins of COVID-19. This is a new one, and this is disputed now. I'll get into that in just a bit. A lot of folks have noted, yes, a lot of countries seem to have been cooperating with this Wuhan laboratory, including some U.S. financing, which is being investigated as well, that U.S. taxpayer money was going into some research projects at this laboratory. But continuing on, it, can, it says, quote, as intelligence agencies investigate whether the virus inadvertently leaked from a Wuhan laboratory, the team and its research, led by scientist Shi Zheng Li, feature in the dossier prepared by Western governments that points to several studies they conducted as areas of concern. A few interesting things about this. Uh, I'm sure many of you saw the documentary Epoch Times put together, which of course featured me as one of the main researchers on it, tracking the origins of the Wuhan coronavirus. If you haven't seen it yet, Check out our videos. We have it in the videos on this uh, channel. A couple interesting things there. We also note in that documentary this scientist Shi Zheng Li, you know, under, otherwise known as the Bat Woman of China, one of the top bat coronavirus researchers in the world. It's interesting that she's become a main figure of their investigations because she also became a main figure of our investigations. And it's also interesting that the alleged Australian government trained and funded team of Chinese scientists. Uh, working at that laboratory, they mentioned that they made this virus that could be transmitted from bats to humans and had no cure. We do note in the documentary one of the experiments that Shi Zheng Li had actually done where they created chimeric viruses, in other words, man-made viruses, uh, merging together different viruses, which they tested on mice and actually wrote about the Western papers on it, showing that they would destroy the lungs of mice and had no cure. And what 
catches my attention here is that the quote had no cure part. Uh, maybe they're looking at the same virus we were looking at uh, that we mentioned in the documentary. They do mention here though that they went on to genetically modify it and that it could be transmitted from bats to humans. Um, the virus we mentioned was the one where they tested on mice and they were going to be testing it on primates. I don't think we showed they could test it on humans or transmit it to humans. Although we do note, of course, in the documentary, and of course this is public now, that um, Xi Zheng Li was known for something very specific, which is she had found the bat coronavirus that did not need an intermediary species. In other words, she had found the key that would allow these bat viruses to infect humans directly. Uh, notably, she found the coronavirus, the bat virus that she believed was possibly the origin of the SARS virus, may be a big piece of this as well. Again, this is all speculation based on uh, documented research. Not clear whether the virus we're seeing now is directly tied to this, but at the very least it's being looked into. And if this 15-page document from Five Eyes is real, as the Daily Telegraph alleges, uh, it is very interesting. But moving on based on that, Fox News said a senior U.S. official corroborated these claims. And it says, quote, while U.S. intelligence is not confirming the existence of the 15-page document, in other words, this Five Eyes document, it says a senior official told Fox that reports of the document align with U.S. intelligence that China knew the spread between humans earlier than it said, that it knew it was a novel coronavirus earlier than it said, and that it was spread wider than they reported to the international community in the first few weeks, or sorry, the first weeks of the outbreak. It continues, but there are some exceptions. In particular, Australia believes the virus originated in a wet market, as the Chinese have claimed. However, the U.S. intelligence community has not yet uh, determined this and is still leaning away from that theory. It says, quote, A senior intelligence source told Fox News on Saturday that most, as many as 70 to 75 percent, of the 17 U.S. intelligence agencies believe it came from a laboratory, but the remaining agencies cannot yet agree as there is not yet a smoking gun. Or sorry, is there, there is not a smoking gun. Okay, quick uh, correction in just what I just read. I note that uh, the part about the Australian-funded uh, research was disputed. I misinterpreted that. It says Australia believes the virus originated in a wet market. That goes back to a public finding, actually. Now, thinking about this, there were some reports on this that uh, the Australian government had been told or had been provided intelligence suggesting this was a lab leak, uh, but they had determined based on their analysis, they believed this, this, this was not a lab leak. And one important thing to note here too, when we say lab leak, it doesn't necessarily mean man-made. You know, of course, they had many, many, many viruses at these laboratories, which is what they were doing, you know, researching these, vir these viruses. If it leaked from a lab, it doesn't necessarily mean man-made, although as these reports note, uh, they were working on uh, man-made viruses. They were working on chimeric viruses. And so, you know, they had both there. Who knows what this is? And now continuing on this, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says there's a significant amount of evidence the virus came from a Chinese lab. And so it seems that this alleged Five Eyes report is being at least somewhat corroborated by an alleged uh, senior U.S. official and by Pompeo to some extent, at least saying there is evidence uh, to suggest that it did come from a laboratory. And of course, it does seem all eyes are on the Chinese regime's P4 laboratory right now. Now, you may remember in previous episodes, I've talked about some cases that have come up where Chinese individuals have been arrested in different countries, such as Brazil, where there was that uh, Chinese national who was hoarding PPE, for, uh, protective personnel equipment, and also allegedly had slave labor, allegedly had a weapons cache. It was possibly two rifles by his bodyguards. The reports might have been exaggerated initially. But I noted in my analysis that this looks like the United Front. Because several of these cases where you have these individuals arrested in different countries had some commonalities. Namely that the individuals arrested who are hoarding this gear, this equipment, just so happened to be tied to Chinese uh, fraternal organizations, what he called Tongs. And many of them also had ties to high-level government and high-level business. 
some of them even to uh, the criminal underworld, you know, organized crime. Of course, this is an official government branch of the Chinese Communist Party, right? The United Front and Work Department, sister branch, Overseas Chinese Affairs Office, the OCAO. These are basically one of the main uh, branches of Chinese overt espionage. In other words, espionage that takes place kind of out in the open. It doesn't always, you know, violate the law. The United Front, for example, in New York, as I mentioned previously, is actually listed on the uh, Chinese consulate website, at least unless they removed it in the past couple months. What is interesting now is I, I mentioned that these cases seem to be tied to the United Front, and this has now been at least corroborated. Global News in Canada is now reporting that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, rallied United Front to stockpile medical supplies. It says that in mid-January, the Chinese consulates in Canada and around the world issued an urgent call for this. And it says, quote, in just six weeks, China imported 2.5 billion pieces of epidemic safety equipment, including over 2 billion safety masks, Chinese government data shows. And it continues, quote, through clandestine United Front networks run out of Chinese consulates in cities from Vancouver to, Dur to Toronto, to New York, to Melbourne, to Tokyo, the Communist Party urged millions of, quote, overseas Chinese to bulk buy N95 masks in order to ship back batches of scarce supplies to the motherland. And so this is very interesting because it shows that these, the actions of these individuals who have been arrested in some countries were part of a Chinese regime plan, a call to action. And on a few different notes, one being that the Chinese regime was hoarding medical supplies and basically gathering to itself all the international PPE, which would leave the rest of the world vulnerable, uh, when they knew, of course, this virus was spreading and would very likely get out and other countries start taking it seriously. But it shows, again, the close collaboration between the United Front, the Tongs, and the Chinese Communist Party, between these different organizations and how they interrelate. Now, going a bit deeper into this, the Chinese Communist Party allowed international travel when internal travel was banned. This is one of the big things that's being accused of right now. The fact that when it banned external travel from Wuhan inside China, in other words, people from Wuhan weren't allowed to go to other parts of China because they feared the virus would be spreading, they still allowed people from Wuhan to travel internationally. And so this is, of course, one of the main points being used right now to look into whether the Chinese Communist Party uh, intentionally allowed individuals to spread the virus abroad. Were they intentionally spreading the virus abroad? And now it comes out with this report saying they made this call to action through the United Front saying that they knowingly and intentionally hoarded the world's PPE, protective gear against this virus, which left most of the world vulnerable. And there's a very interesting part to this too. So in early March, when the virus was beginning to spread more widely abroad, Xinhua News wrote an article saying that if the CCP restricts pharmaceutical exports, the United States would be, quote, plunged into the mighty sea of coronavirus. Now, the Xinhua is, of course, in the United States listed as a foreign mission of the Chinese regime. Uh, in other words, it's not just a media company. It's basically, it's recognized in the U.S. as a branch of the Chinese government. This is an official mouthpiece of the Chinese government. And this is interesting because it shows that the Chinese regime would understand the importance of medical equipment and medical goods uh, facing this virus. And, of course, going into this a bit deeper... The CCP destroyed evidence of the outbreak, concealed information from the world, directed its overseas networks to buy up global medical supplies, then announced through a mouthpiece media how vulnerable it could make the U.S. if it was denied, if the Chinese regime denied exports of pharmaceuticals. And of course, the Chinese regime controls most of the world's pharmaceuticals. And so based on this, I would say when it comes to proving intention from the Chinese regime, we could at least, at the very least, say that they knowingly carried out a lot of these acts and made very hostile statements around these acts. Now, moving on, based on this, the Nikkei Asian Review had an article saying China knew of lab safety concerns from last year. Now, it notes that Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, ordered that biosecurity at labs needs to be a national security issue. 
And of course, this took place when this outbreak was ta- was happening, and he made that announcement in context of the virus outbreak. The article in the Nikkei Asian Review cites a Chinese political source, it does not name this individual, claiming, quote, At first glance, Xi's February order to enact a biosecurity law seems to have come up abruptly. That's a big misunderstanding. China has been preparing for it carefully for quite a long time, conscious of how the country was perceived overseas. On October 21st last year, Well before the first infection acknowledged by the Chinese government, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, China's parliament, received its first report detailing the draft biosecurity law. Now, this could mean a few things. It could mean the Chinese regime was, of course, uh, moving forward on this biosecurity issue at its laboratories prior to all of this, knowing that this was an issue. In other words, it, it was putting in place safety requirements that really should have been there already. In October. Different reports suggesting that even as early as October, the Chinese regime may have known something was going on. And it adds, quote, the carefully curated draft law is watertight, but the measures were not introduced in time for China to prevent the Wuhan outbreak. Instead, information was initially covered up and China's first steps were delayed. And so again, pointing to the fact that yes, there were Uh, very likely safety issues at this laboratory. Of course, a lot of the individuals tied to the laboratory, you know, the ones who have been allowed to come out, have been saying there's no issues with security at our laboratory. You may have seen some of the mainstream media articles citing these individuals saying that. And this article from the Nikkei Asian Review says otherwise. The Chinese regime did have laws, but these laws were not passed and not implemented. Now, moving on to something that could impact all of us a bit more directly, There's a report now saying this virus outbreak could last up to two years. Now, hopefully that does not mean governments will try to keep us on lockdown for two years, because I don't see how that's ever going to work. So this report is from the University of Minnesota's Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, and it was put out on April 30th. And it's an analysis based on eight global influenzas since the 1700s, including four global influenza since the 1900s, including the Spanish flu. And it looks at similarities and differences between those and the current virus we're facing. It says, quote, Based on the most recent flu pandemics, this outbreak will likely last 18 to 24 months. And it says it likely won't stop until 60% to 70% of the population is immune. Now, again... This is just uh, analysis. It's not necessarily, you know, it's not hard science. They're analyzing it based on previous virus outbreaks and what we saw with them and using the data from these previous virus outbreaks and comparing it to the current one. Based on historical precedent, it could last 18 to 24 months and may not go away until 60% to 70% of the populations, I guess, around the entire world right now become immune to it. Now, moving on to some questions and comments from readers. It's, of course, Monday. So, first question up from Sujoy Chanda. China understands that the world will stop buying their products, and so they will stop labeling their products as made in China. They will either use some other short, short form or not put any labels in their products. So, how do common people identify China-made products? I think you're right to an extent, Um, but when it comes to the big companies, when it comes to things like Xiaomi, Huawei, uh, China Telecom, the the ones that have bigger influence, the high-tech ones, of course, we know they come from China, and those ones, if those get hit, of course, that whole market's going to die. When it comes to the counterfeit goods, of course, it's hard to crack down on unless you go after the marketplaces themselves. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's tried buying electronic equipment on Amazon and had trouble finding products that were not Chinese knockoffs. So, for example, I've been trying to buy a webcam because the webcam the webcam I have on my computer isn't very good, honestly. But looking at the different options there are on Amazon, it seems like a huge portion of them are Chinese knockoffs. Um, I would imagine going forward, the knockoffs are going to continue. In other words, this, you know, all the low-end technology, the more basic stuff is going to continue unless platforms, marketplaces like Amazon and others are cracked down on and are made to stop importing those types of goods. 
Uh, there was an update saying some of these marketplaces were going to start including country of origin. The difficult part is where you have Chinese company, companies operating in other countries. So, for example, in Italy right now, there's been a lot of controversy around this because there are a lot of Chinese, you know, made, made in China goods being manufactured in Italy that are being called made in Italy, and the government has been concerned about them affecting the Italian brand because they, of course, don't meet the normal standards that Italian products are expected to hold. And of course, the other factor to this would be supply chains. This is this is a big issue, actually. In fact, the U.S. government has been trying, U.S. government, U.S. military, been trying to deal with this for years now. Uh, there were some different analysis that was done on U.S. military equipment, including things like fighter jets, and they found that some of the basic components were coming from China. And of course, there was a lot of concern about it, about how do you, you know, get rid of these issues, because there was concern that. Some of these products may be non-functioning. Some of them may have, say, embedded cybersecurity threats, which does happen. There's been a lot of analysis on Chinese electronic equipment showing that within the firmware, a lot of times, you do have embedded threats. And of course, individual companies can argue, oh, well, we don't do that. We don't do that. They're kind of right. It's a Chinese regime doing it. It's, it's part of Chinese law. Under the Chinese regime's national security law, all technology, all information, needs to be secure and controllable. All companies will have to provide their data to the Chinese regime if they ask. And so if you're operating in China, you have to follow Chinese law. Companies manufacturing electronic equipment that would impact data are going to have to monitor data and make that available to the Chinese regime. You know, they can't function otherwise. And so, yes, you're right. There is going to be, I think, a bigger push to crack down on these made in China products. So three points to this when it comes to the big brand name Chinese companies like Xiaomi, Huawei, you know, China Telecom, very likely we are going to see a big crackdown on them internationally. And their goods are probably going to be either boycotted or people are going to, you know, maybe governments themselves are going to move away from them. Uh, for example, Huawei is under a lot of fire right now, not just in the U.S., but around the world. When it comes to the products being sold on things like Amazon, allegedly they will start including country of origin. You know, maybe if there's enough pressure on these companies or on the U.S. government to crack down on these product streams, something will be done. Notably, a lot of people complain that when they put their products in Amazon, they get you know ripped off, and then Amazon sells the ripoffs, which then compete with them on the same platform. And so some of these platforms do allow Chinese knockoffs to compete directly with the products they knocked off at prices they can't compete with. And the third factor would be the supply chain threats. The Trump administration has announced that it's going to be doing some things on this. There have been some reports on it. Uh, this goes back to the Obama administration when they were doing the initial analysis of supply chain threats for the U.S. military. We'll have to see where this goes. Now, moving on to Neil Kay. Josh, you probably know better than most, CCP propaganda very often seems juvenile. That's right. It's like some high school kids are behind it. Seriously, it's also rife with supposed quotes from foreign governments. For example, the U.S. that uses phrases no American would ever use. It would be hilarious if it didn't come of a, out of a very dangerous nation. A friend of mine from China sent me some of the propaganda that has been blasting them there at home for weeks now. She asked me about it because she was alarmed and concerned by the onslaught of propaganda against the USA inundating their Chinese media. Some of the stuff is utterly ridiculous, but for the average Chinese person, they have no idea what to believe. My main concern from some of the stuff she described, this is an effort to prepare their people for war, the rule of no one wants to think they are a bad person. And so most manufacture justifications for their actions. This is fundamental human nature. Think the cheater in a relationship when discovered telling the other person all their faults that drove them to do what they did. So two points here, one being Chinese propaganda, how affected are Chinese people for, uh, from it, and uh, whether this is the Chinese regime preparing for war. On the war part, I don't think they have the capability for it right now. The Chinese military doesn't have the strength, at least in my analysis, to do something that drastic right now. If they were to launch anything, it would be through their unconventional warfare systems, which the Trump administration has been pretty heavily focused on. And so I don't, I don't think they'd have the capability for it. Of course, I wouldn't put it beyond them. I know some other researchers have been, of course, saying the Chinese regime does appear to be preparing for war. 
great friend of mine, Jeff Nyquist, actually, I had him on the show before. Uh, he does believe that that is the case. I had, I've had some conversations with him about this recently. But again, all the cards are in place. It does appear that they're trying to do it. Unclear whether they'd have the strength to do it. When it comes to the issue of Chinese propaganda, yeah, a lot of it is pretty juvenile. A lot of it is pretty poorly done. At the same time, it is pretty effective at times. A lot of the noise stuff, like, the, you know, the comments you see on social media isn't as effective, I don't think. Because a lot of time that's their, you know, death by a thousand cuts approach. Those are the 50 cent army folks who, you know, are pretty much just low level grunts carrying out this kind of work. When it comes to the more refined high level stuff, though, I'd say they're unfortunately very effective. For example, you can see a lot of big media directly citing main Chinese mouthpieces like Global Times, like Xinhua, for example, like their, author like, like, like their authoritative uh, media. Uh, you also see some media even running direct inserts like China Watch, published by China Daily. I think 30 major U.S. publications run China Watch inserts. In other words, taking money for, you know, for China Watch from China Daily, which is registered as a foreign mission of the Chinese government. In other words, a branch of the Chinese government. In other words, they're taking money from the Chinese government to publish this propaganda. And of course, other issues such as, uh, you know, certain outlets running directly South China Morning Post. Of course, South China Morning Post was more respected before, but then they got bought up by Alibaba's Jack Ma. In other words, you know, playing they're still playing according to the Chinese regime's game. They're not going to have non-biased stories. They're not going to have uncensored news. You know, they are to a degree a mouthpiece to an extent. And so it's it's hard for people to see through this when it does appear there are authoritative publications that are directly publishing Chinese propaganda. And of course, when it comes to Chinese diplomats, when it comes to, say, Chinese academics who are sometimes working on behalf of the Chinese regime, giving quotes to big name media or criticizing them and then getting their, you know, quotations published like their authoritative figures, um, I'd say it's really hard for people to see through stuff like that. And so, yes, the low level stuff they do is is juvenile and ridiculous. The high level stuff they do is I think terribly effective sometimes. Although I do think people are becoming more aware of it. When it comes to the Chinese people themselves being misled by it, it's mixed. Uh, a lot of the Chinese netizens actually see right through it. They joke about it, they make fun of it. A lot of the average Chinese are unfortunately very misled by it because a lot of them, you know, even in the US, a lot of the, you know, first generation immigrants, they'll still use CCP run uh, platforms like social media platforms. And all of the media on those platforms are all CCP media. And so they're not hearing anything outside of that. Their entire worldview is shaped by these, you know, by the information that's presented to them, and they have nothing beyond that. And so a lot of them are pretty brainwashed by it, honestly. They, they don't get opinions outside of it. And of course, a lot of them were raised in that system, and they, they just think like that. They, 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 they don't have information they would allow for them to see outside of it. And so a lot of them are actually misled by it. Um, in fact, Vice News had a great story on this, saying that in China, a lot of Chinese, most Chinese, it said, believe that this virus came from the United States, because that's what Chinese media have been saying. They call it the USA virus. Now, moving on, Tony V. Joshua, I think perhaps you are missing a part that is being covered up. Under international agreements and accords, creating and or maintaining biological weapons is a violation of those agreements and accords. I suspect that China does not want any information out that would prove that. Yeah, Tony, you're right. Um, of course, the Chinese regime signed on to the Biological Weapons Act in 1984, and a lot of countries are also part of that. There was actually a State Department report that came out before this whole virus thing even started. I think it was 2018. Uh, stating that the Chinese regime had continued its biological weapons programs under the guise of, say, dual-use technologies. In other words, they can say they're working on virus research or things like that, but it also has a military component to it. The State Department report notes that when the Chinese regime signed the Biological Weapons Act in 1984, they did not even acknowledge the biological weapons programs the U.S. knew they had before that. In other words, the U.S. knew for a fact China had biological weapons programs. They never, it, the CCP never admitted they had those programs. They never showed evidence of getting rid of those programs. 
And so it's ink on paper, nothing more. And they haven't been held accountable for it. At the same time, when it comes to international communities, including China, a lot of times, now this is what I've been told by pretty good sources, a lot of times countries, and pretty much every developed country unfortunately does it from what I've been told, they call their biological weapons programs defensive programs. And so they run them under the guise of defensive programs, but basically the research is the same. And so this, this is one of those dirty international topics, in my opinion, that um, is unfortunately murky and masquerades behind an international agreement that really doesn't do anything, at least as far as I can tell. Now, moving on, RG. Hey, Josh, first time commenter here was just wondering what types of threats or pressure you have received from the CCP as I'm sure it's happening to you. Might make for a great video. Keep up the great work. Yeah, I appreciate it. Geez, so I've been a reporter with Epoch Times since 2006, and I've been an investigative reporter since 2008. I, didn't, I did a video with American thought leaders, actually, that I, I tell the whole story of it. If anyone's interested, we can include that below in the description. So long story short, my my whole foray into investigative reporting was actually unintentional. I stumbled across the Chinese regime's united front while, while doing some local reporting in New York City and basically uncovered uh, that these Tongs, these fraternal organizations, were working with the Chinese consulate and beneath these they had Chinese mafia operations that were running. They were threatening Chinese individuals in these communities. In, in, it was uh, Flushing, Queens one of the largest Chinese communities in New York, where I did most of the reporting. But of course, found they were doing it in all the Chinese communities in New York. I had people telling me that they were threatened. I remember one woman, I won't forget, she said she was from Taiwan, matter of fact, so she wasn't from the mainland. She told me that these people told her they could make her disappear. I found that people on American soil, Chinese people, are afraid to speak out against the CCP because they're afraid their families are going to get attacked, and they're afraid for their own safety because of these networks. And so between 2008 and about 2012, the bulk of my work was investigating and exposing those things. I did a lot of reporting on that. Uh, during that time, I did, get, I did actually get a lot of death threats. Um, I personally don't think they were official death threats. I think they were individuals who I was exposing at that time getting annoyed at me. <laughs> some, some pretty serious stuff. One of the one of the official death threats wasn't directed at me. It was directed at one of my sources at that time. They slashed the, the tires of his car, and they told him they hired a hitman to chop off one of his hands. Personally, I don't. I have never felt that my life was actually at risk. A little bit back then, I, I did go through kind of a mental process where I, you know, I was of course discovering pretty concerning things. I did have to decide whether it was worth dying for if it did come to that. You know, my thought process was basically in the end, well, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? If I don't expose it, who's going to expose it? And at that time, there, were, there weren't really any reports on the United Front. This, this stuff was largely unknown at that time. And so the process of, you know, uncovering it and exposing it was uh, put me very much on the front lines, if you, if you want to call it that. These days, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't gotten death threats in years, at least not serious ones, at least as far as I can tell. I do get monitoring issues. I do get attacks. So, for example, after that documentary came out, I was doing a lot of interviews, all you know, media all around the world, and the Chinese consulates in some places did shoot back against that. And so, you know, there were some personal attacks from Chinese consulates, you know, very recently. I also had a very bizarre experience <laughs> very recently as well, where I was I was doing an interview on a radio show, and they told me that there was another call on my line. And they said the individual on the other line was speaking Chinese. And of course, I was doing this call from my home, and there's nobody speaking Chinese here. I, I did not personally hear it, but that's what the radio you know, uh, controller people were saying. And so, you know, there's some weird stuff going on. Personally, I don't feel at risk in any way. Uh, but of course, doing this kind of work, you just, you just get, you know, get, used, you get used to it, uh, just being honest. Uh, moving on, plums and berries. Mr. Phillips, please get some rest. You don't look so good. You will exhaust yourself to death exposing CCP, which is a lifetime's work because these are evil people. Please take care of yourself and thank you for the good work. Yeah, I really appreciate it. 
A few of you commented I look very tired, and you're totally right. I've been very tired lately. That documentary we did got, oof, geez, when, by the, when we were censored by Facebook across all platforms, in other words, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, NTD, which is sister media of Epoch Times, and the Epoch Times website, we had about 70 million views on it. And I think the number now is over 100 million views. A lot of the inquiries on that were directed towards me. And so I've been doing nonstop um, international media interviews, uh, U.S. interviews, and so on. And of course, getting a lot of researchers comment, or contacting me. And so yeah, luckily, that's starting to go down now. It's, I'm not getting nearly as many now. And, uh, and so folks, again, I really appreciate you, you know, thinking about my health. That said, I did get one other question. Someone asked about this painting uh, and some of the I guess, furniture I have. Actually, interesting story. It was a friend of mine, a friend of my wife's actually. Long story short, her mother was, you know, her mother's older and she was dying. And of course had an apartment and a lot of old furniture. She was trying to sell this furniture. Now this is pre, this is pre Chinese Communist Party Chinese antique furniture, including this chair, and actually a lot of my love in my house. I'll explain how that happened. Basically, she was trying to sell it. She couldn't sell it. She tried giving it away. She tried donating it to like thrift stores and Goodwills. They wanted her to pay them to take it. And so, you know, she called up my wife and she's like, hey, I know you guys like, you know, uh, classical Chinese stuff. Would you be interested in this uh, furniture? If you come pick it up, it's yours. And I was like, yeah, I'll take it totally. Um, you know, of course, I'm critical of the Chinese Communist Party, but I love I love traditional Chinese culture. Now, that said, folks, again, we're going to be broadcasting Monday through Friday, so please don't forget to tune in. We're going to be focusing very heavily on this new coronavirus, the CCP virus. Uh, next episode, we're actually going to have an inter interview with Sean Lin. He was the Army virologist featured in the documentary. And so, you know, don't miss that one. We have some good stuff coming up. Also, that said, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Again, I really need your support. And apparently, if you have subscribed before, please double check and make sure you're still subscribed because we've been getting a lot of reports saying that people are seeing that they've been unsubscribed. That said, folks, again, thank you. Appreciate your support. Uh, take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time.